Daisha Today with Damien Tiernan on WLR. With thanks to Mulliganspharmacy.com. Life's a beach with Mulligan's Pharmacies. Open late on the Dunmore Road and in Tremor. Did any of you watch that Channel 4 programme, uh, Train Your Baby Like a Dog, last night? As I was talking to um, Yvonne and Ollie there, it um, really lit up uh, Twitter. Um, it was absolutely mad. This was a, she's a, an animal behaviourist, and she thinks you can apply those principles to uh, child rearing. Um, and everybody went mad as if the woman said, "Build a kennel out the back garden and move your child into it, and then take it for regular walks and vaccinations to the vet." Uh, which wasn't what she was saying at all. But I'm just interested. If, did any of you watch it, and uh, what you thought of it? We're going to be talking about that uh, on the show today, and also, as I said to. Um, Ollie and Yvonne, uh, a diagnosis of dyslexia. We're going to be talking about that as well. What happens when you get your diagnosis? Where are you then? Are you just, you know, cut adrift or what happens to you and the difficulties uh, that's involved in that? And if you or your other half has a work wife or a work husband, how does that work out? Uh, you know, do you think it works well? You have really it's all the hallmarks of a marriage except you know uh, nobody has to wash anybody else's pants uh, which is always a good thing but you can let me know your thoughts on uh, that sort of strong platonic relationship um, that you might have with a colleague or your other half has with a colleague that you might wonder about sometimes or not Um, and we're going to be talking about that on the programme as well and plenty more uh, to come between now and midday Um, as well as Brexit, as I said, the Brexit soap opera trundling on at, you know, in reverse gear at this stage. It's just every time we think it can't get any worse, there it goes, rears its ugly head and gets worse. Uh, but let me know your thoughts on that as well. How you get in touch with the programme? It's 83 975 uh, You can use WhatsApp for that or you can call 051 846 123 uh, and have your say on that or anything else that we're, we're not talking about uh, and you think that we should be. Um, please feel free to get in contact with us as well. But first up this morning the school bus scheme in the news again as it seemed to be every year. It comes under the remit of Minister of State for Training and Skills John Halligan and he's on the line now. John, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Maria. This school bus scheme seems to cause consternation every year. It does. And maybe if I explain to viewers, as I've done all over Ireland at present, um, the, the, uh, sc- the school transport scheme was put in place uh, in about 1965. The objective of the scheme was to make sure particularly children in rural areas um, were able to get access to the nearest school. Right now we have... Um, the, 117,000 children being moved twice a day by 5,000 vehicles uh, covering 100 million kilometres a year. Out of that, uh, we have about 13,500 special needs that are accommodated into the scheme, and rightly so. Uh, Many of these have to be moved by taxi, private transport, and with carers. The cost of the state now has risen to 209 million a year. The difficulties we face, Marie, is that the scheme was put in place for eligible children and special needs children. These are children that were in the requisite dis- distance of the primary school and the post-primary school. What happened was, and I inherited this problem, that when there was a bus, we'll say, we we'll give an example of a bus, maybe a 25-seater bus, and there was 20 eligible children from the village or town or wherever. And rather than leave the bus go with five empty seats, we push children that were not eligible, mm-hmm. which were then called concessionary. The problem we have now is that we now have 30,000 concessionary children in the scheme, which is, uh, the scheme is creaking. Uh, the vast amounts of money that's been put into it, and I could say this, and I, mean, I don't agree with this view, but it is quite often being said to the Department of Education, this is not a special budget, but it's from the, it's taken out of the education yeah. budget that we spend all of this money on getting children to school and we don't spend it in the classroom. Now, I don't agree. I don't, uh, that, that view is not sustainable to me. We need to get our children to class. But every year, the scheme is creeping because we require more money uh, because there are more eligible children coming into the scheme. There are more special needs coming into the scheme, which accounts for over 50% of the budget. And then, of course, we have more concessionary. So the problem I face at present is that right now today, Right now, today, all eligible children have school transport or they have a rural grant. All special needs children are covered. My problem is 
right around the country is concessionary children who are not eligible at to try and get them on buses. And that's where the difficulty is. But there seems to be two elements of this, John, in that some people have paid their money and have now been told that their child doesn't have a place on a bus. Well, you see, the problem, dear Marie, is that uh, if, if there's an indication that there's spaces on a bus, uh, people register as early as they can in April all the way up to July to try and get a place on the bus. But the problem we face uh, logistically and also legislatively is that if, uh, if an eligible child then makes himself or herself available for that bus, that child, by law, has to be put on the bus. So the concessionary child uh, does not get, get a place. But I will say this, that there is some good news. Um, we've, we've now announced, and I spoke to Joe McHugh, uh, during the week that we are now going to take 1.4 million or 1.2 to 1.4 million out of the education budget immediately to, to deal with a number of the concessionaries. And already we've dealt with some of the ones with problems we've had in Waterford, Agleish, uh, where we, we've been able to deal with the problem there and we have transport for all of those pupils there. So we're looking for 4.4 million, which is a big ask from Deeper because what they say is you're looking for this money for students that are not eligible. I'm saying that 4.4 million would take all concessionaries. I think we're left with about 1,600. It fluctuates. I'm not definite on the numbers between 1,600 and 2,000. But it would take all concessionaries and get them buses this year. So right now we have 1.4 million, 1.2, 1.4 million. Uh, we're in negotiations. It is difficult. I'm not going to say otherwise. Uh, that Pascal O'Donnell and others will say, look, this money is part of the education budget. You're looking for us to take this out of the budget to give to school transport. That means we have to cut the budget somewhere else in the education team. But my job is to get children to school as minister dealing with school transport. So my view is that uh, we need to get children into the classrooms. The only way we can do that is get more buses on routes. And the way to do that is extra money. But John, is it not a more complicated system than it needs to be? Are you not giving yourselves work to do with the administration of this? Because surely if you start school at such an age, you're going to be in that school for a few years. So you get your place going in and you stay there. You don't have to reapply. You have your place till you leave that school and go to secondary school or whatever. And then the other people who apply who don't have a place, you know how many of them there are. And then you, you get buses to, to deal with those people. Yeah, very good question. And like, first of all, let me say that they acknowledged that this is one of the best schemes in Europe. 99.9% of people using the scheme are very happy. For instance, there was a a review, a cost for pay review done uh, in 2016, which showed that, uh, like, for instance, families pay parents about 17 million in total. All of the rest is covered by the department. But to answer your question, uh, yes, uh, what happens is that children, that, that uh, an eligible child that has uh, been placed on a bus for a number of years through their term from primary school or third level education, continue and remain on that bus, but they must pay the fee. What happens is uh, sometimes um, we find that um, applications don't come in in time or people maybe take it for granted that because they're in on the scheme and because they have that place on the bus uh, that they need not apply and they don't do it. So if you don't apply and you don't put your child's name down, the department cannot be sure if that person wants to go on the bus again. So what they do then is they put a concessionary in place. But I will say this, that if you look at the scheme in total, as I said earlier on in my initiatives, we are we are uh, uh, more than 117,000 children. It's a phenomenal positive scheme uh, right across the, uh, the, the country. But it is important for me to find solutions to make sure, uh, even though I am going against what the department are advising regarding concessionaries, that we try and get as many concessionaries. And in fairness, Maria, we have, we're carrying 27,000 concessionaries as it is. We're carrying almost all children that are looking for school transport um, at a huge cost to the state. Because in but an the, ideal world, uh, I'm sure, John, you'd agree, every child should have transport to school, whether they need it or not, because the amount of traffic that's going to be outside in a couple of weeks' time with people being brought to school and dropped to school, that if, if all the school buses, if school buses were used in all cases, that would completely transform rush hour traffic. Absolutely. No, absolutely. And I agree with you, Maria. And I've been saying that and I've been arguing this case. And like I've set up an all-party uh, 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 committee on school transport 
Uh, we've met Bus Aaron with them. We've met uh, School Transport, which operates from Tullamore. Uh, they, all of the TDs in the Dáil, for the first time uh, under my ministership, have uh, dedicated numbers for Bus Aaron that they can contact in the region. And I, as Minister, have never turned down an offer to meet families, uh, children. I meet them regularly. Um, uh, I, I, I'm with my secretary at present here now, and the week before last, we were in the Dáil at 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, trying to organise carers for special needs, trying to organise transport for special needs. Working, We work as best as we can. And again, if I had my way, and it's all down to finance, uh, I would have every child covered. But again, you have to remember that the scheme was put in place originally, mm. and it continued to develop that way, that it was for eligible children, special needs children, and all of those children today. There might be little hiccups here and there in the system, but generally speaking, any child that's eligible, if they don't get a bus, they get a rural grant. Every special needs child, providing we have organised the carers, guard clearances and so on, for carers, which is another issue we have to deal with, and that lands on my uh, in my department, that all of those children are, 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 are involved in the scheme and getting school transport. So essentially, Maria, it's a very, very good system. Uh, just before I let you go, you're actually talking to me from Russia. What are you doing in Russia? I'm in Russia with the world skills. Uh, I'm the first minister to represent Ireland since 1957. Um, it's the world skills forum where Ireland have won in excess of 70 gold medal, medals over the last number of years. So we have representatives from apprenticeships and skills all over Ireland, including Waterford, that I meet in Kazan tomorrow. So I'm looking forward to that. And I'll be speaking uh, there uh, with other ministers from other countries. I'm actually making the main speech because Ireland's skills are recognised as being some of the best in the world. OK, well, thanks very much for taking time out to talk to me this morning, John. Minister of State John Halligan there and uh, for those of you wondering why I didn't ask him about 24-7 and all that, John has committed to coming on this programme in studio. You have to have discussions like that in studio. There's no point in having discussions like that on a phone line from Russia. Uh, so he will, he will, before the end of August, uh, he will be in studio with Damien and uh, all those questions will be put to him. So uh, don't worry about that. Um, Let's have your thoughts on the school bus scheme. Uh, delighted to hear you discussing the school transport system again, uh, says this texture. I've been in school transport system for 12 years since my children started primary school and now I've been advised that there is no accommodation for them on the bus service to Dungarvan. I've no idea how I can get them to and from school as both of us work. I most certainly hope our minister is going to sort this issue out ASAP as school starts on Friday. It must be so stressful for people like if, if you can't you know, you, what way? What are you supposed to do? You heard the um, the girl earlier on saying, you know, I have to be in college at nine o'clock. How am I going to get my, my two children uh, into school? It just seems to be a system that as it, I, I, in my opinion, and I don't have children who use it, but in my opinion, it doesn't work. It might work for a lot of people. For the people who doesn't, it doesn't work for, it seems to not work for them for a stupid reason, if you see uh, what I'm trying to say here. Anyway, 83 3 uh, Let's have your thoughts on it. Or 051-846-123. Back after these. Data Today with Damien Tiernan on WLR. With thanks to Mulligans. Did you know you can collect your Blue Club points online? See mulliganspharmacy.com. You are welcome back to the programme. Uh, lots of reaction coming in to my chat with John Halligan. Uh, Judy says we don't want bullshit from Halligan. He went into government with the promise of delivering 24-7 cardiac cover within 18 months. We have no cover now. On the uh, school bus scheme, uh, hi, my family has used the scheme for the last number of years. I find it one of the best services the government provides. We would be lost without it. And I think, as I said before I went into the break there, for the people who work, it works for, it's brilliant. But there's nothing to say that having used it for several uh, years that you mightn't get a place next year. And this seems to be a problem that it seems to be this arbitrary thing uh, instead of just saying how many people need the bus, count them up, they're going to need it next year and then the overflow people um, and just like put the buses on more often or get more of the bloody things. It doesn't seem to be rocket science to sort out. But the amount of money, uh, you heard John say how much it costs to administer and that comes out of the Department of Education's budget. It's a huge amount uh, of money. Um, 
Hi, Maria. Why, this, see what you think of this. Why do we have a bus lane on Waterford Quay before the Tower Hotel? Most cars drive in the bus lane. Can the Gardaí give you a ticket and points on your licence for driving uh, in the lane that is from Willie? Um, it's, it's a good question. I pass that way uh, myself regularly and I often wonder that. It just seems to be making trouble for people trying to get into the lane if they don't want to drive in the bus lane. But then the bus lanes, I presume, are only um, operational at certain times. Um, well, I see now. Uh, we'd just like to thank John for all he's done behind the scenes for Waterford. He never gets enough credit. Uh, they're coming into 083 That's how you get in touch with the programme. Now, if you were watching Channel 4 last night, um, you would have seen a new programme that's 25,000 people in, in Britain signed a petition not to have it aired. Um, it's presented, well, the person involved in it is Joe Rosie Haffenden, who's an animal trainer, trainer, behaviourist, and uh, she also has a degree in human psychology. And she thought, why don't I just train my, my children the way we use, uh, you know, things to train my dog? Uh, it's not gone down well, shall we say. Let's have a listen to what she um, has to say. Just bear with me now. This is her explanation of what she does. To find my way as a parent, I suddenly started using the principles that I'd learned about animal behaviour and applying them to Santino, my boy. So is it rewarding? Boy. It's rewarding the right thing, but it's so much more than that. It's so much more about setting the environment up so that the animal is likely to do the thing that's going to get them what they want. And it's so much more about teaching them to behave independently and autonomously and showing them that actually if they do X, Y and Z, they can open it themselves or they can put their shoes in themselves um uh, just like we do with dogs it's about creating an environment where it's safe mm-hmm. for them to experiment and yeah. then showing them what experiments actually lead to the consequences that they want now um as i said this um woman is called Jo rosie huffenden and she says if everyone parented the way we train dogs we would end up with more confident compassionate and curious human beings does she have a point not according to the twitterati she doesn't but let's see what lucy wolf pediatric sleep consultant and author has to say uh, you're very welcome back to the program lucy hello how are you i'm good thanks uh, did you see the program i did i watched it what did you think i obviously i suppose I don't feel that animal training and child development should be aligned. I don't think that. But I do think that some basic principles of what she introduced are not to be dismissed either. I think the problem is that she was using like a clicker Mm. and incentive. And I suppose from my perspective, and I suppose bearing in mind, you know, typical childhood tendencies and, and everything that we know about child development and emotional health and well-being, I feel that those um, techniques, if you like, I feel that they ultimately may serve to undermine and diminish self-worth and encourage, in time, you know, feelings of, low feelings of self-esteem. And would, so the, would the star I, charts come under that heading, Lucy? You know the way yeah, you have I kids know, and look, yeah, you were... Would that come under that heading? Would you feel the same about that? Can do. Yeah, it can do. Like, I don't, as a practitioner, implement those type of strategies. I um, have a holistic approach and I suppose I try to help parents honour the unique relationship that they have with their child. I want them to be responsive. I want them also to parent within a loving boundary. And I feel that all those things can be done without, let's say, this type of... I know she's calling it positive reinforcement, which it is but I feel that there are more wholesome and authentic ways of us doing it. And what I really feel is that what the show has highlighted is the lack of support that parents actually have and information that they need in order to succeed and strive in their parenting career. Ah, Lucy, come on, there's information everywhere for parents on how to parent. Probably too much information might be the problem. Well, there is a conflicting information for sure. But like if you take the family that were dealing with their little boy who was having lots of tantrums, you know, you get to a point as a parent where maybe you feel that you like they had said they'd tried everything. And you, you, you get to a, like a saturation point, unfortunately. Mm. But I think that our parents, our, our generation of parents are maybe not serviced with the tools going into their parenting career. Yes, there's loads of information out there, but unless you actively go and do a parenting course or you subscribe to a particular approach, then as you're faced with those challenges, 
then it's very hard to know how to deal with them. And every child is different. Every parenting unit is different. The stresses that are in the household are completely different. And I guess that, you know, if we look at child behaviour, and let's say that little boy in particular, the changes that the animal trainer made are sensible tra- changes. I am absolutely not endorsing what Channel 4 have done with this show because I feel there are hundreds of qualified childcare um, practitioners that could reasonably go and do something similar in a more authentic way. And uh, did you see the clip? What did you think of the clip where she says sit and the dog sits and the kid sits? I thought it was cute. I know. Yeah, I mean, like, I just don't, I, I just feel that we have to value the relationship that we have with our children it, and deal with them as complete individuals and to view challenging behaviour as a, a, a their way of communicating that there is an unmet need and it's about trying to understand the communication and get in underneath that in an effort to try to help, you know, have a more harmonious parenting uh, and, and, and home life. I mean, I think that the show itself was, you know, it's kind of, it did what it wanted to do. It created lots of controversy in advance. It made lots of people watch it. And I guess there were some things that she made suggestions about that are, in some ways, you might view them as being common sense. Mm. But again, it's difficult when you're stuck. And I know this with working with tired parents that you can't see the woods for the trees. And it's very hard. And what the show really showed is that parents, when they have a plan and they have some things that they can use and they have more confidence and belief in themselves as parents, that we can start to affect change. Um, Because we have, there's, there's very many different ways, and you're right, like there's different methods of parenting being thrown uh, at people right, left and centre. I was only talking last week about on the programme about this gentle parenting lark where you don't say, you know, you don't say no to your child and you don't say anything negative to your child and they re- literally let do whatever they like if they don't take on board your gentle explanations. No such thing as a naughty step, no such thing as any of those uh, things. And it it doesn't seem to be necessarily working out very well for the people who uh, implement it in their homes. Um, th- there is an awful lot of information, isn't there? Oh, there is. And I suppose, obviously, in the last 10 years and, and maybe even a little bit more, like my oldest child is 17, we didn't really have great internet at the time. And now, you know, everything, it's social media orientated. Everybody has an opinion. And there are so many different schools of thought. And I think that that is one of the biggest challenges for the modern parent is that there are too many sources of information. Now, I add to that voice. I know that. But again, I generally try to feel that you're trying to help parents figure out what feels right for them and what their, what what resonates with them as a parent. And that will be different from each child that you have. But again, if, they, if we go into it and we have more information, and I suppose I'm not a fan of techniques because I don't feel that we should be using techniques with our children. But I do think that if we have ways of managing and coping and communicating, then I feel that we are far, you know, we are far more effective as a parent it in, just, as a result. It just seems, and I'm obviously speaking as a non-parent, which is probably very apparent every time I open my mouth, but um, it just seems to be very, very complicated these days. And people... Parents seem to be almost overwhelmed with the idea that they're bringing, they're going to bring up this human being who will be everything they put into them. And they have a huge responsibility to do that. So they're trying to do the best they can. And sometimes in doing the best they can, they're making it worse than it needs to be because their child is running rampant around the place and has no boundaries whatsoever. I know, and I suppose it is challenging. Like, I mean, modern life has hugely affected our parenting. You know, we are under lots of stress. You know, there are potentially two working parents in a family unit, long commutes, long working hours and responsibilities. And you do have this huge responsibility to try to, um, you know, create and uh, accompany your child on a journey so that they become, you know, well-rounded, fulfilled you know, people. And that is a huge responsibility. And, you know, the different challenges that are there for us, you know, especially when you start going into the teenage years, you know, there are so many things that we have to deal with. And so it's any wonder that we struggle in lots of different areas. And I think what we really need is support and compassion for ourselves and each other so that we really can, 
you know, be the best that we can be and feel that we are enough as parents. And I think that is really important. And I think some person, uh, parents need to know that sometimes you will give out to your child. They're not going to grow up into broken people because you shouted at them once. You know, there's a kind of an overreaction sometimes to the fact that you might have lost your temper and shouted at them and worry about the damage this has done to them. We were all shouted at when we were growing up. We got over it because the next minute we were getting hugged and Mammy and Daddy loved us and that was the end of it. Yeah, I think our, our most important task is to encourage our children to feel loved, safe and secure. And even in those times when you are not your best self, for whatever reason, that at the end of that, that they still feel connected and valued for the people that they actually are. And that, you know, we all have those interruptions where we have, you know, less than desirable conversations and arguments, but that we, the, that the person that you are dealing with, your child, always feels loved in that context and that there's coming back from that all of the time. We are only ever doing the best that we can and that's really important because people, especially I feel this generation of parents, we do feel that like we're not enough and we do feel that we're failing. You know, that's one of the over, biggest overriding thought processes for a lot of parents is that they don't feel that they're, they are good enough and they feel that they're doing it all wrong and I hear this time and time again with parents that I'm working with and they feel that they're failing and again we really need to in, you know, help support them, change the language that we use around um, each other so that we are we are creating um, a, you know a valued relationship and we are helping people to establish you know I guess I call it a parenting career because that's what I think that it is and I suppose it's just about trying to help everybody feel that they are you know worthwhile and I suppose valued and authentic and I think that is super important. Lucy, just before I let you go, um, I introduced you at the start as a paediatric sleep consultant and you've been on the programme before in that capacity and you've uh, written a book as well. Um, But you've branched into products now, Sleep Through. What's that? Uh, Yeah, I have a product range. um, As as obviously a sleep consultant and a parent myself, I just felt uh, maybe two years ago one of my children was really struggling with sleep because she had some social issues in school and she was just really uh, challenging to you know achieve and maintain her sleep and I was looking for something natural to try and help you know enhance her sleep practices and there wasn't really anything that I felt was suitable there so of course I felt that maybe I could um, develop a range and I have done I have a a body and bed sleep spray and a relaxing rub and it's 100% natural uh, paraffin free, sulfate free, vegan friendly, cruelty free, and the products are just used as part of your bedtime routine. Uh, they're a blend of essential oils. All of the ingredients are designed with obviously great sleep in mind. Well, you um, never know, Lucy. Maybe you can branch out yourself. If the dog trainers are encroaching on oh, on your yeah. territory, you can maybe do a sleep spray for the dogs and then to, and right back at them. <laughs> Lucy, thanks a million for talking to me. See you, bye-bye. Bye That's uh, Lucy Wolf there, paediatric, paediatric, I can't talk today, paediatric sleep consultant uh, and author. But uh, what do you think of this idea of training? Um, I think a lot of people, particularly on Twitter, didn't watch the programme and thought that everybody was going to say, sit, stay, walkies when they want to go out in the pram or something or in your bed or all the things that we all say uh, to or maybe leave them alone in the house and go be back later now mind the house and all the things we say uh, to our dogs uh, this texture says a lot of parents would want to take that on board because children today are totally ignorant and disrespectful to older people and some parents couldn't train a dog never mind uh, children they have too much leeway and too much of everything today except manners and respect and that's down to so-called parenting we all learned from our elders so they'd want to start taking that on board uh, 083 double three double three nine seven five is how you get in touch with your say on uh, the whole parenting lark or you can call oh five one eight four six one two three back after these data today with Damien Tiernan on WLR with thanks to Mulligans did you know you can collect your blue club points online see mulliganspharmacy.com you are welcome back to the program it's Maria in for uh, Damien um, Helen says Maria regarding training children like dogs Pavlov did it with his dog 
dogs and he's famous worldwide. Uh, perhaps this woman is hoping to become a famous leader like Emily Pankhurst says Helen talking about uh, Joe Rosie Huffington I presume. Um, I'm a mother of three says this texter and in my personal opinion if you need to go to parenting classes you shouldn't be a parent. Let's have your thoughts on that. Somebody else says good God how do we manage to rear good honest and obedient children? What a load of nonsense. And uh, somebody else on the um, about John Halligan. John Halligan went into government with the promise of a second cath lab, not 24-7. Let's be clear, clear on this, says this texter. Uh, you can't have 24-7 without two cath labs. And uh, Now keep going, John. You're doing better than most we had in Waterford over the years, with the exception of Dr. Noel Brown and Martin Cullen. You were up there with them. They're coming in to 83 975 You can use WhatsApp for that, or you can call 051 Now, my next guest is somebody who normally um, might be somebody that we call to talk about programmes like How to Train Your your Baby Like a Dog. Um, but she's here this morning to talk about something else. Siobhan O'Neill White from mams.ie. You're very welcome back to the programme, Siobhan. Morning, Maria. How are you? Um, now, I have very disobedient children. I'll just start off. <laughs> very, I failed to train them in any way. Well, maybe you should have said sit. Stay. She didn't do that, to be fair to the woman. She didn't do that at all. Yeah, um, no. <laughs> but we're, we're talking but about... I do think if parents need help, you know, ask for it. There's no shame in it. Ask for it. We've a parenting coach on mom's daughter. There's no shame in it at all. Ask questions. No problem. I think the premise of the show was fairly decent, like a positive reinforcement yeah. and all of that yeah. lark. I think people are completely overreacting to the fact that it has dog and baby in the same title of a programme and that it, sort of yeah, nonsense. Um, yeah. Now, but the reason we're talking to you is the story yeah. of your, your own daughter. It's a, it's a quite a personal story uh, for you and the recent diagnosis of dyslexia. Can you take us through that, please? Yeah, you know what? It's, it's been astonishing to me how this whole thing has unfolded. So, We've known for quite some time, obviously, there's a learning difficulty there. And in terms of reading and spelling and just understanding a word, the last couple of years have been quite tough. She's bright as a button, very observant, very creative, you know, excels in lots of areas. Uh, the reading would be, reading and writing would be, would be the problem. So we asked for, you know, some help from the school. The school has been amazing. They've given her lots of extra help. Uh, we wanted to know, is it dyslexia? How do we find out if it's dyslexia? We didn't even know how to find out. So eventually we had um, a psychologist come to school and meet with her and meet with us. And finally, after many, many, many years of waiting, we got the categorization of dyslexia. So I thought, Grant, now we know what we're dealing with. Obviously, there's going to be tons of support for us and loads of help. And it's all going to be easy peasy. Uh, no. The Department of Education has been so unhelpful, I've actually got my local TD involved. That's how unhelpful they've been. Well, that's what they're there for, to get involved in things like that. Yeah, exactly, um, they are, and fair play she is. But uh, they tell you that, uh, so for, for when they do the test, they use a standard IQ test to test children who are displaying signs of dyslexia and learning difficulties. A standard IQ test, it's like asking someone who's colourblind to take colours off a chart. It's not an applicable test for a child with those difficulties. Yeah, you're on the it's back foot from the first, from the get-go. Exactly. And then they put in this, um, they put in this rule that if the child doesn't score above 90 in this particular test, the Department of Education offer no support. So most children don't score above 90 in this test because it's an unfair test to give to that particular kind of child. So I've been speaking with the Dyslexia Association of Ireland. They're lovely. They're very helpful. They've been trying to get that test abolished for, about, for the last couple of years. Obviously, the government are very slow to react. So what happens is, psychologists said to us, yes, it's dyslexia. Yes, she's going to need some extra help in school. They advised that we should get her a laptop. And they advised that we should get her a reading pen. And a reading pen is a special pen that when you roll it across a word on a laptop, it will read out the word to you. Oh, so it's okay. very clever. It's mm. very, very clever. Um, up until last week, they only came with an English or American accent. As of this week, they come with an Irish accent. So her one will be speaking, at least in an Irish accent. Um, there's a great company in Sligo called CompuPack IT, and they are really good with the reading pens. They offer a lot of support. I'd, I'd be happier to do that than go, say, to buy it online so have you, have on you, Amazon or something. Have you, is the problem sort of sorted now? Would you have to sort it yourself? No, no, is that what you're saying? No. no? So, so basically, the Department of Education say your, your child has this problem. You're going to need to get a laptop. You're going to need to get a reading pen. 
And then I said, so I said to the psychologist, so where do we get the laptop and where do we get the... Re- do I just go to my local, you know, retail park yeah. into the electrical store? She said, yeah, for the laptop, yeah, for the pen, I don't know. And I thought, this is the expert sitting across from me telling me she doesn't know. And I said, so are the Department of Education, are they going to give us any help? Is there any financial support available? Do we apply for a grant or something like that? She said, well, if she had a score above 90, you would have qualified. Oh, for God's sake. You don't qualify. So because of that one thing, you don't qualify. So that's why the Dyslexia Association is trying to have that chucked straight out. But of course, our government are very slow to react and that's why I've got it. So your your child has been diagnosed with dyslexia? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's yeah, levels, after the diagnosis, there's levels of whether or not you qualify for help. Do you have a diagnosis? Yeah. yeah. And I actually said to the psychologist and my husband, I was quite annoyed, obviously. I said, so you're telling me it was under 90. So would that not mean she needs the laptop and the reading pen more than if it was over 90? Yeah. I said, so it's a contradiction. Well, I suppose it is in a way. I mean, I literally, the steam coming out of my ears at this point. The, the, just the stupidity and the lack of common sense that's been applied here. And there's parents dealing with this all over the place. Um, so I, I, just, I couldn't believe what, I, what, I was, what we were dealing with. Then it gets even worse. After, so the Department of Education says, yes, your child has this issue. Yes, you need support. Yes, you need a laptop. Then, because they don't issue her with the laptop, because she didn't get 90 or above in the test, We have to apply for accommodation to the school to have her be allowed to use the laptop. Oh, for God's sake. Yes. Now, can you actually fathom that? I mean, it's it's so ridiculous. I I can't even believe it's a conversation that we're having. It's so ridiculous. So the the laptop's near 400 euro and the reading pen's around 300 euro. And the reason I'd say buy it from a company like CompuPack because... At least then you have someone on the other end of the phone you can ask mm. questions to because it's a complicated product. Whereas if you get it on Amazon or something, you you might not have that level of support. And how old is your daughter now, Siobhan? She's just turned twelve. Yeah, it's taken it's taken so this long. Five years yeah. of of her twelve years has been taken up with trying to um, yep. find out does she have dys- dyslexia? Even though I'm sure you thought she definitely has something, I mean, whatever it is. Listen, homework, everyday homework, crimes, her crimes. Me crying, me going to the school saying it's not working, the extra support is not working, them telling us we got her reading books, we got her, to, you know, books that read out loud. Yeah. We've done everything. Now, in fairness, the school has been very good and their hands are tied to a certain extent because they request an assessment for, say, 10 children and maybe three children get assessed. They're, they're never given as much as what they need. Yeah. So they have been, and in fairness to them, they've said with the laptop, of course, she can use the laptop, of course. She can use the pen. But when she transfers into secondary school, we have to apply again. Now, I don't think it's going to be a problem because the schools have a good relationship together. Mm. But we still have to apply for accommodation. But, uh, as, as far as I'm care. aware, and I'm not a doctor, you don't become cured of dyslexia. You have it, you, no, might, you, you can do. manage it, but you don't become cured of, of it. No, there is no cure for yeah. it. She sees the world in a slightly different way. So just even the word circus, she... The letter C is such an issue because it can be a cu- or sound and it's very difficult for a child with dyslexia to, you know, the amount of words, she, and she tries to say, she tries to say a word and it's circus. And I said, well, that one is circus. And she's like, how do you know? How <laughs> do you know if the C is, w-? and it's only things that you and I would take for granted. Mm. When you think about it, it's just because we've learned it and we know it. But when they're coming across words like this, that presents a real challenge. So the fact that the, we have to, we're going to have to fight for her to be able to use that laptop for secondary school. We're going to have to fight to make sure she can use it for her junior cert. Um, okay. We're going to have to fight for the leaving cert. And then we're going to have to fight when she's going to third level. Now, look, we'll fight. Of course we will. I'm her mother. I'll do anything for her. But it's just so much energy that is being wasted on something that should not be an issue in the first place. OK, we have to leave it there. Siobhan, thanks very much for, for telling us the story. I'm sure everyone listening who's in a similar situation is grinding their teeth in frustration as well. Thanks a lot. Uh, that's Siobhan O'Neill white there from mams.ie. Uh, is that ringing a bell with you? 083 is how you get in touch back after these. 
Foundation Today with Damien Tiernan on WLR. With thanks to Mulliganspharmacy.com. Life's a beach with Mulligan's Pharmacies. Open late on the Dunmore Road and in Tremor. You are welcome back to the programme. We're returning now to the subject of the school transport scheme. Like I said, it seems to cause consternation every year. And I have on the line Fianna Fáil TD for Waterford, Mary Butler. You're very welcome to the programme, Mary. Good morning, Maria. And Maria, can I just say at the outset, thank you very much for giving this issue so much airtime because it's hugely important for many parents who are currently affected by the criteria set down by the department. For me, the crux of the issue is how they determine which child is entitled to an eligible ticket for the bus and which which child is a concessionary ticket. And if I could just give an example that happened to myself last year. Mm -hmm. I've I've had two children who attended St. Exxon's Community College in Kilmac Thomas and they were always eligible. But last year my my, um, daughter started secondary school in Kilmac Thomas and the Department of Education determined that the majority of pupils in Port Law would only receive an eligible ticket if they travelled to school in Carrick on shore and that those who wanted to travel to school in St. Eglin's Kilmac Thomas would be concessionary. There was a half mile in the difference of the length of the journey. Mm. Now, I argue the point that no child should be forced out of their county because it was, suit- it was, it was suiting the bus, but I got nowhere. So for people who don't actually have children maybe on the school bus or maybe don't understand concessionary or eligible tickets, the Department of Education are completely inflexible when it comes to where your child should go to school. So we made a decision that our child was going to go to um, St. Eccles, Kilmac Thomas, where I went myself and her, her two siblings went. But she now has a concessionary ticket and I could be facing the same problem myself any year. So I suppose the point I really want to make is the criteria set out by the, by the department, which bus Aaron have to use, is completely inflexible. I mean, I made the point to John, it just seems to be how this is administered, is, how this scheme is administered seems to be causing a rake of problems. Absolutely. Like, the officials in Bus Air, and I've been inundated with two different groups of parents from West Waterford. For example, the Blackwater Community School, there was, there was a dozen children affected there. And currently at the moment, um, there's a group of children who live in Ballyduff Upper in Waterford, and they travel to school in Fermoy, which is in County Cork. And 11 children of 16 are concessionary, and 11 of those kids have been left, left off the bus. The department official told me that the criteria is stringent, it's rigid, and there's no movement on it. And when I spoke to Bus Air and the official told me their hands are tied, they have to adhere to the strict terms and conditions set out by the department. The problem is well known within the department, and it is completely, completely inflexible. And if I could just say, in fairness to Minister Halligan, I've been working with his office on several of these cases, and everybody wants to solve the issue. Mm. But there's a complete reluctance by the Department of Education to address the issue between who gets a concessionary ticket and who gets an eligible ticket. And if more eligible tickets were allocated at the start, we wouldn't have as many issues arising. Yeah, that's that's my point. Like you're making life hard for yourselves with everyone complaining about the system that you're trying to operate because of the way you operate it. Do something different. Absolutely. And you see, the problem we have, Marie, is parents applied for these tickets in good faith at the start of June. You pay your money then in mm. July. And parents were informed then three weeks ago, some in, in some cases two weeks ago, that their children now will not have a seat on the bus. Most children are returned to school next Tuesday, the 27th of August. And you know, parents, as I said, these parents now in Blackwater, there's 11 children of seven families that have no way of going to school next week. And one parent contacted me this morning, Maria, and the human side of it, she's awake all night. Um, she did appeal um, to Bus Aaron what they have, their, 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 their reason for not taking her two children to school. And the money was refunded into her account yesterday before she even has time to sit in front of them and discuss the appeal. So as I, I keep going back to it, there's such an inflexible approach. I deal with this. This is my third year dealing with this. If you remember last year, there was a situation in Butlerstown when there was three little brothers. Um, RTE covered it. The little five-year-old brother had to wave his two, his two brothers off to school. He was left standing on the side of the road, and that was not resolved. 
I don't think the appetite is there to resolve it from the Department of Education. I certainly believe the appetite is there from the two ministers who are dealing with this. Is it just now, that it would involve change? Are they just intransigent, intransigent and inflexible to any kind of change in how they've done something for years? Yes, I, th- that's what I believe. And the change, we have tried to instigate this change over the last two years and we're promised every year that change will come, but it doesn't. It's the same situation every year. And, you know, Maria, when you're starting into secondary school, it's such um, a huge upset for family and pupils. Some, ch- ch- some pupils transition so easily, but other pupils don't. It's a huge stress for them. And not to be able to travel to school, not to be able to travel to school with your own friends, to have to be dropped by a, by, you know, by a neighbour or maybe to have to um, organise a carpool. It makes life very, very difficult. And, you know, I'll go back to the point again. There's seven families up in West Waterford and they do not know whether their children will be on a bus next week. Now, I've been working very, very hard on this and we were told two days ago that there was an extra million allocation to try and resolve these issues. But when I contacted Bus Aaron yesterday, um, the man who deals with it for the whole South East told me he's in a vacuum. He has heard nothing from the Department of Education. So these families are, were here today, Wednesday. They're still in a vacuum, not knowing whether their children will be on the bus. Mary, can I just Tuesday. ask you a question? Uh, and if you could be brief in your answer, because I'm, I'm quite short for time. Nobody's living five hours away from their school that the bus has taken them to. Can the bus not come back and do a second run? Well, that would make perfect sense. Now, a lot of the buses do that already because I know, for example, most buses actually do the secondary school drop first and then they come back and do the primary school drop. Um, So that is happening. And in most cases, they do try to um, have the bus utilised as often Mm. as possible. But where you could solve one of the situations, Marie, is instead of having a 28-seater or a 32-seater, if you put on a 40 or a 50-seater, you would be able to carry most of the children. We're going to need a bigger bus. And a bigger bus would solve a lot of problems. <laughs> Mary, thanks very much for talking to me. Thanks, Maria, for See the time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That's uh, Fianna Foyle TD, Mary Butler there. Um, back after these. Data Today with Damien Tiernan on WLR. With thanks to Mulliganspharmacy.com. Life's a beach with Mulligan's Pharmacies. Open late on the Dunmore Road and in Tremor. You are welcome into the second hour of the programme. It's Maria in for Damien. Uh, lots of reaction coming into what we've been talking about, particularly the programme about uh, the dogs that was on ch- how to train your baby like a dog. Uh, and this person uh, says, just give me a second here. Um, I sort out my screen. Yeah, I have a pet hotel and care for dogs overnight. My cousin had a problem trying to get her toddler into the bath. I suggested she give him a little treat at bath time and it worked. He now loves bath time, even without a treat. Also, a few years ago, there were two programmes on back to back. One was Super Nanny and the other was It's Me or the Dog. The format of each programme was identical. The only difference was one for children and one for dogs and both worked. Uh, this programme is blown way out of proportion, says the texter. I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, somebody else, Eileen, says the programme had its good points. It's all about uh, rewarding the good behaviour with treats and ignoring the bad. They learn, both dogs and children, that this behaviour doesn't work. I have a dog and children. And somebody else says, some children are not taught basic manners. So a busy waitress having to go back to a table four times for a 10-year-old to make up her mind about what she wanted. Keep them coming, 083 3333 uh, Or you can use WhatsApp for that or call 0518461123. Now, if you're looking at the front of the Irish Independent this morning, uh, you will see how... Uh, musician Frank McNamara and his barrister wife Teresa Lowe um, have walked away from 2.93 million euro in debt uh, after a High Court judge found in their favour. Favour. It was written by uh, Charlie Weston, personal finance editor with the Irish Independent. Charlie, you're very welcome back to the program. Thanks, Maria. Thank you. Um, I think first looking at this, the initial response would be. Oh, yeah, when you owe loads of money, like you get to walk away from it. But um, if you owe a small amount of money, they'll they'll hunt you down uh, like a dog. Whereas there's a little bit more to it, isn't there, in this case? Yeah, it's fairly, compl- it's pretty complicated to say the least. I mean, there was a judgment, a written judgment issued by the judge yesterday and it ran to 88 pages. So that'll tell you how complex this is. It's not black and white. Uh, obviously, there's enormous debts here and it's an extremely sweet deal. And I'm not uh, for, for any, uh, uh, for a moment trying to lessen the, the, the sweetness and what an incredible deal they got. But you've also got a question what Bank of Scotland were doing uh, back at the time, advancing so much money. And there was a whole range of of other uh, banks and institutions uh, owed money. There's Bank of Ireland, 
the Cabot Financial, uh, Permanent TSB, money owed to the revenue. So there were bills everywhere, but, uh, debts everywhere, but um, they seem to have walked away with, with uh, a mind-blowingly good deal. They get to keep their home. It's been uh, written down to a value of half a million from 2.3 million. They have a home, nice home in, in Dunshockton. We have an aerial view of it in the Independent this morning. Uh, Dunshockton County Mead, they get to they, they get to pay back the mortgage then over 20 years at a, at a tracker mortgage rate. You know, a tracker My mortgage has been here. gone a long time. Yeah, exactly. 1% over the European Central Bank rate. The European Central Bank is zero, so they'll be paying 1% at the moment. It's an extremely sweet deal. To be fair to them, uh, Mr. McNamara, who, as re- you, people will remember, was the musical director of the Late Late Show for decades, and Teresa Lowe used to pre- present the Sunday night programme, Where in the World, the quiz programme, which was very popular. Uh, but um, the, the, Mr. McNamara will have to give over a big lump of an inheritance, and that has to be clarified. If that's all clarified, this deal goes through. Uh, about 80, 180,000 euros in a, in a lump sum from an inheritance from his parents and a, and a pension as well that he had from Aviva, €25,000 worth. That will have to be handed over as well. Other monies are being handed over. But essentially, they have got nearly €3 million Euros of debts written off, which they had built up uh, through uh, borrowing big uh, by buying a house which was overvalued back in the boom property days mm. and then they got into financial difficulties and they remortgaged uh, Mr. McNamara says he was owed a lot of money from royalties he did a lot of work in America conducting orchestras and uh, composing tunes and he reckons he was owed about a million dollars in royalties that he never got 1.2 million I think it's about a million euros um, so uh, th- this one seemed to turn on something quite technical the judge reckons that um, uh, uh, you know the the, the, the fund that bought the, 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 the main mortgage, which is the big chunk of the debt, uh, they bought the debt from Bank of Scotland, Ireland, Tanager is the name of the fund, the Vulture Fund. Uh, he reckons they'll do better out of this than if this couple were declared bankrupt. And that's the key thing here. Look, if they were just declared bankrupt, the judge reckoned that they would, the Tanager, the fund, would get 22 cents in the euro back. Under this deal, they get slightly more, 27 cents in the euro. So they're going to do about 5 cents in the euro better off under this deal than bankruptcy. So if they're were declared bankrupt, they'd lose the house uh, and everything would be sold and the, the tanager wouldn't get that much back. They could do slightly better under this deal. The tanager don't like it. They opposed it mm. all the way. This has been in the courts for ages and uh, it was voted down by a tanager. Um, so it's, it's certainly it's a personal insolvency deal. Uh, they get to keep the house. A big chunk of their debt has been written off. The judge seems to have gone, uh, gone with the um, Mr. McNamara and Ms. Ms. Lowe on the basis that this returns them to solvency their their income is is low at the moment this is as much as they can afford and um, uh, the, 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 the house is worth nothing like it, it, it like the mortgages that were taken out on it it's a house now worth half a million euros there was mortgages of 2.3 million euros on it so you know, you got to question what the banks were at as well back in the day, giving out that kind of money and allowing a remortgage. But at the end of the day, they've got themselves an incredible deal here. They get to keep their house. They've got two kids, and uh, they, if they can repay the, the the mortgage and you know uh, g- g- satisfy the judge on the inheritance that Mr. McNamara has, they look like they've walked away with one of the sweetest deals you've ever seen in this country. It's amazing, isn't it? Um, mm. And as you say, if the the Tanager people had agreed in the first place, um, they wouldn't have ended up in court in, in, in over the whole thing. But it's when you think of the the amount of money that's involved here, and as yeah, you say, well, huge. like was there anything? Was there any fallback on the banks on this? Like what were you doing, giving out that kind of money, or would that come into it? Well, it should come into it, and uh, it's one of the reasons why Bank of Scotland pulled out of this market because they over overlent. They were stupid. Let's face it. You know, they gave out too much money here. You've got to question people borrowing these high levels uh, of money as well. I mean, it wasn't just for the home. There was investment properties. Since been borrowings for all sorts of things. There was land involved in in this deal. Complicated stuff. Um, sites, etc. So, you know, it seems like Frank McNamara and Theresa Lowe borrowed an awful lot of money, got themselves into huge debt, 3.7 million worth, then couldn't pay it back. Mm. And, uh, and you know, instead of just uh, trying to do a deal back then, which there wasn't the same structures in place to do deals, but, you know, because there's now a formal court-approved system, the person insolvency regime, uh, but there wasn't the same structures back then. But instead of trying to pay it back, they, they did a remortgaging deal in early in two, two, 2000 uh, on the basis that it was, they were going through a temporary financial uh, hit and that they would get back on the on track again. But that didn't work out. Uh, 
they then tried to do, uh, you know, they got into trouble with the mortgage. The, the Tanager bought the debts off Bank of Scotland. They got a possession order at one stage. They were going to repossess the house. After that, then, uh, Frank McNamara and Theresa Lowe opted for a personal insolvency arrangement. They tried to put a personal insolvency arrangement in place. That was voted down by most of the creditors. Uh, you know, there's a creditors meeting. All the people who were all the institutions that were owed money voted, voted on that. There's some question about how revenue voted on that. And that's what the case turned on, basically. Because if all the creditors had voted against the, 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 the personal insolvency arrangement, the personal insolvency deal, it would have been gone. They wouldn't have got that. They would have just been declared bankrupt and all the money uh, it would be written off, but they would be left with nothing to probably would have lost the house. So it, it, it was all very, te- it was quite a technical one, this one. I don't think it sets a precedent as such because there was a, a lot of technical arguments around mm. the role of revenue and all of this and whether or not they voted in favour of the uh, restructuring, essentially, the uh, insolvency deal. And th- it's been going on in the courts since 2014. It's been going on forever. Uh, and now they're at a situation where they, they seem to have done very well. And uh, Theresa Lowe is a barrister, do we know? Did she represent herself? No, themselves? I don't. No, no, no. No. The, no, the barrister in this case was a man called Keith Lowe. He's very good. He specialises in in these kind of insolvency deals and appeals uh, over insolvency deals. She didn't represent herself, uh, and they had um, they had a, a personal insolvency practitioner, uh, James uh, Green from the Cambridge Stuffy. Uh, so you know they had they they, they did the right mm. thing. They got good advice. They brought in uh, experts. You know, unlike Pamela Flood and Ronan Ryan, you know the uh, uh, ex Miss Ireland people. I mean, they 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 they. they they don't seem to have been very well advised and, and uh, they seem to have uh, got themselves in trouble by going to one judge and not being upfront with that judge, uh, uh, you know, about the, 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 the mess that they're in. Um, so, look, at, I suppose one of the lessons in this is it's a, it's a monster write-off of debt, a monster write-down. One of the lessons is if you go and get good advice, if you go to a personal insolvency practitioner, even if you've huge debt, you can still you can still get to a situation where you can have that written off where you can get back to solvency. And solvency is essentially you, get back to, you, you, you pay back what you're able to pay back, not yeah. anymore. And that's what they got here, but they were very lucky because this turned, as I say, on an, on some technical issues, uh, you know, the, and also you've got to question the role of the banks in throwing out so much money at them as well. God, I'm sure they'll sleep well tonight. Charlie, thanks very much for talking to me. You're welcome, Maria. See you, Thank bye-bye. You. That's uh, Charlie Weston, personal finance editor with the Irish Independent. Um, so when you look into that story, a little bit, there's a little bit more to it than the fact that, you know, there's this perception that if you owe a whole load of money, it'll be written off. But if you owe a little bit of money, uh, then they'll chase you down for it. But uh, there's a little bit more to that story. So we thought it was worth uh, covering for you. Oh, eight three double three double three nine seven five is how you get in touch with the program or you can call 0518461123 back after these Data Today with Damien Tiernan on WLR With thanks to Mulligans Did you know you can collect your Blue Club points online? See mulliganspharmacy.com You are welcome back to the program This text just says hang on now Mary Butler Mary Butler was on talking about the school transport scheme uh, Mary Butler is in a party that's propping up the current government This is like Mary looking into a mirror and giving out to herself uh, Noah says Maria who runs this country the minister for Transport or the government uh, Fianna Fáil are supporting this government the civil servants run the country like the civil servants run the country ministers are just transient beings who are there and they're out front and they're saying they do this that and the other and in actual fact they may get to do this that and the other um, but really it's not their call I don't think I don't think it's their call at all um, on the subject of uh, what I was talking to about the um, dyslexia just listening to the mum speaking about her child with dyslexia. I'm ashamed to be Irish, says this texter. This government is a disgrace. Education, health, etc. No parent should have to fight for what is our right as citizens. They are well able to take our taxes and give nothing in return. And don't get me started on the guard the station. What for people need to wake up. They are walking all over us. Um, where is I'll let it get another one now. Um, Somebody says, like like I said, like get bigger buses. Uh, that's what you do. Why can they not increase the size of the bus? I've no way of getting them to school. We're both working parents. Uh, this is uh, the person who can't get three children in the bus from Kilrossenty to Dungarvan. Uh, been in the system for 12 years, pay their money um, and she will be getting in touch with uh, Mary later. Um, it just seems to be a bit of a disaster. And as I said, I can't understand if you get this disaster. See, this is what, this is what drives me mad. If you get this kind of a disaster, 
every year, then find another way to do the bloody thing. It costs enough money. Like, what is it, 206 million, I think? 206 million to, um, to operate this system. Uh, what are you getting for your 206 million? Can you, if all the strife that it caused to the people who don't get on the bus, and it is strife, it mightn't be strife for people who have the money to just shell out for a taxi to take their kids to school every day. But if you don't and you're trying to do your best or you're a single parent, parent or you haven't got the money or you have to be in work and your boss isn't going to say, yeah, come in at 10, no problem, take the kids to school. That's not the way life works. Um, it's, it's just It just seems to me to be absolutely bizarre. Now, I wouldn't have thought that there is still uh, kind of gender stereotyping in terms of activities and uh, sports and everything for kids. But apparently I'm not entirely correct because somebody who definitely knows better than me is Jen Hogan, who's a mother of seven and a blogger. She's Mamatude and she's also an author. You're very welcome to the programme. Uh, back to the programme, Jen. Thanks, Marie. How are you? I'm good, thanks. Now, do you still think there is that sort of, because you've, you've written about this in the, in the Irish Times, do you still think there's there is that sort of gender stere- gender typical decisions that parents make when it comes to what their kids do and activities and after school things and hobbies and that? Yeah, there still seems to be, um, speaking to both parents and um, people who organise the, the sports and the activities, um, but uh, the feedback I was getting from everybody is that they still are hearing kind of, uh, things like, um, oh, that's not for boys or that's not for girls, particularly when you get into the, the ones that are very strongly associated with the gender. So I suppose in the, in the article I wrote, I focused kind of on boxing and rugby, the real physical sports, and, and excuse me, in, in those sports, um, they were very much considered not for girls, particularly as girls got older. It was all grand while they were younger, but when they got older, there was an expectation of how girls should be and how young t- young women should be. And uh, even in the boxing club, um, Derek, who I was speaking to, said that you tend to find the girls drop off as they get a little bit older because it's not it's not ladylike, it's not it's not acceptable for girls. And and that's really pressure that the girls are feeling from other girls. Really, it's not even from the adults; it's from each other. That's that's what he felt. With the rugby again, the the little girl was the only um, girl in the team. Because and and the mum I was speaking to actually told me that within her family she was hearing, well, you know what, it's really not the sort of sport you should have girls involved in. You're better off having her in the sort of things that other girls will be in. And, she, and this, as this girl said, the mum said, her daughter loves dressing up as a princess too. She likes doing everything. Yeah. <laughs> if they consider anything um, not um, acceptable. But uh, she was definitely getting the feedback, um, very negative feedback from her within her own family, that this was not something that was suitable for her daughter. But was pro- what was probably actually more noticeable was how unacceptable it is because we do champion girls kind of, you know, breaking the stereotype and kind of going forward and doing things that are just for boys. We are not as accepting the other way around. And there is huge negativity if a boy does something typically associated with the girl. Uh, and that was still, that was disappointing to hear. And I suppose I had that kind of vested interest. I have a girl and six boys, and I suppose I'm always interested to see what does society expect of boys, and it still expects boys to behave a certain way. So while I did get to speak to people where um, boys were involved in things like the drama and musicals and dancing and gymnastics, again things very typically associated with girls. The, the mums and the organisers said it was hard work getting boys involved. And the boys generally are very self-conscious of the fact that they are the only boy in there. The girls didn't seem to be as self-conscious. Maybe they were more affected by what their peers thought of them image-wise, but the boys were very self-conscious and there was a certain teasing. And funnily enough, um, one of the one of the um, activities I referred to in there, actually I spoke to, I spoke to Aideen O'Grady, she runs Star Camp, and that's all around the country. Um, two of my children actually did Star Camp camps this year, and they're kind of performance camp, and the, my two lads, two of my lads did them. And when I was chatting to other mums about it, saying how much they loved it, and my boys loved Star Camp like nothing else. <laughs> but when I spoke to um, other mums, going, oh, do you know what, you have to try this out, just generally chatting, they're going, oh, God, no, and they did the kind of whole jazz hands move at me. <laughs> oh, no, no, my son did not do that. And and so you think that God really do we really still think that way? And and unfortunately we still we still do, we still haven't quite moved on. So we're talking the talk but we're still a little bit reluctant to kind of walk the walk. That's mad, because I would have thought with, you know, so many particularly with the the girls sort of strong female superhero, kick ass, Katie Taylor types yeah. out there that they'd be all over it. And they, but is it that they just when they come out of the gym, maybe they're all sweaty, and the fellow that they fancy is on the corner. <laughs> there is that. 
absolutely. I mean, that, there is that element of it. And that's exactly what the trainer was saying, that when you get to the teenage years, that's when it really when a huge drop-off happens. So there are those, obviously, who are hugely dedicated and focused, and they continue on, and that's always great. But in terms of keeping girls involved in the physical sport, in the really physical sport, that prove, has proven a little bit more difficult as they get older. So they're, it's not such a big deal when they're younger. And, and we very much become accepting of uh, women playing football and mm. ga, um, kind of the gas sports and stuff as well. That, that's not even, um, it's not even that unusual anymore. Whereas when, we, when I was growing up, I played football and it was, I was just, you know, weird. <laughs> it was just weird <laughs> amongst my peers. Why would you play football? You're a girl. That's for boys. But, but now that's not unusual. It's, it's, you kind of have to get into the more physical sports to kind of find any sort of negativity towards it. But unfortunately, on the flip side, it's like the whole way up and the boys definitely feel it. And, and that kind of mocking and, and teasing that kind of goes on. And, and it was, oh, that's the, the sad thing was, it was the parents who were the ones that were making an issue of it. The children themselves didn't um, have a big issue with it. But the, the organisers of the different activities said it was the parents who kind of tended to come out and say, no, that's not really for girls or that's not really for boys or my, my fella wouldn't be into that. And it's that whole preconceived ideas of how girls should be and how boys should be. So it's kind of we're giving we're giving our kids inhibition because they naturally are open enough to try and out different things, you know, they turn on their personalities and interests, of course, but they're, they're not ruling things out. If parents are kind of indicating to them that they should rule things out. You know, we're only paying lip service to half of this gender yeah. stuff, really, aren't we? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, absolutely. So, <laughs> know, you never know. Maybe uh, maybe things will, will change going forward because it is uh, certainly, again, with, um, go back to the Star Camps again, because Aideen was able to tell me that with a lot of work, they've now got their figures up to 40% boys, which is brilliant, but it's getting involved huge work um, getting more boys involved in what was considered a girls' camp. It's it's quite, I, I find it quite extraordinary that it's really the pressure is coming from the parents because we keep hearing that all they're doing is sitting in front of screens all day and da, yeah. da, 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 and they're not doing nothing, that you'd be getting down your bended knees and thanking Jesus if they were out doing anything. <laughs> they're active at all. Yeah, as long, it seems to be as long as they're active in the way that's yeah. gender appropriate, you see. We still have that. And I mean, that's obviously, that sounds like a big sweeping generalisation. That does not apply to all parents, of course. And mm. um, I mean, like, there are lots of parents, and I'm including myself in that, who do encourage their children to be involved in what they're interested in, not what gen- their gender says they should be interested in. Um, but but the, the fact that it still exists at all, or the fact that it is work to get girls involved in physical sports, or especially physical sports, I mean, like, they're really tough ones, and um, to get boys involved in performance or dance, even though it's a wonderful exercise, because it's only what girls or it's only what boys do, it's still it's still a work in progress and it's still something that the organisers of the different camps and activities are very much aware of. And did you think that it, like the girls are just a bit adverse to getting sweaty over anything? Like they don't want to play netball either. They just don't want to get sweaty as well, opposed to they don't want to get yeah. sweaty playing something more associated you with definitely. fellas. You definitely have that thing. I mean, that we know with with sports and stuff that girls drop out of all sports mm. a lot, um, at a higher rate as they get older. You know that we don't have as many teenage girls involved in sports as we have teenage boys, and that I suppose it's it's just kind of the change that comes with the teenage years. There is there is that aspect of it too, but it is it was definitely more uh, more of a factor the the different club camps and organisers um, felt when the sport was particularly physical. So whatever about the hockeys and the tennis and even even the ladies football and soccer that was somewhat still acceptable and I think we have such great ambassadors and the World Cup as well the Women's World Cup recently you know that it's got the whole new generation of um, young girls interested in football again and getting active and that is great but again if, if you're coming from a house where parents don't believe girls to do something and I did I came from a house where my mother was horrified that I played football now I'm a different generation but she was absolutely horrified like and she very actively tried to discourage me from playing it, and um, so oh, we still. I mean, it obviously filters on. Maybe the rebel, the rebel in me, kind of then likes to challenge things a little bit more with my own kids. But I, I suppose there is, it is still filtering through, and even even with younger parents now, it is still there. Um, but um, I don't know. I don't know how we kind of change that viewpoint. Uh, maybe it's it's a case of trying it out. Maybe instead of just kind of talking about it without knowing much about it, maybe it's about giving our kids a chance to ha- have all these different experiences and try out all these different sports and activities and see what they actually truly like and what benefits them. 
Well, yeah, wouldn't you have to ask, like, what's going on in the houses? And you would just think to yourself, if you're the kind who's thinking to yourself, I don't really want my daughter to be playing rugby or I don't want my yeah. son to be doing ballet. Just go, well, now, if somebody said to you, well, you're the woman of the house, so you have to do all the housework and, yeah. you know, get your husband to take out all the bins. Would you still feel the same way? It's so important like that. I mean, that's, it's that mindset that we're yeah. creating from such a young <laughs> age when we do that. But, you know, I spoke to a psychologist for the article too and she was actually, she pointed out that it is so important that we don't kind of gender assign things just like that. And she said, because most kids are reluctant to play even with toys that are gender assigned. So if you if you say dolls are just for girls, well, then boys won't play with them. So we're better off not labelling our toys, you know, and allowing kids to play whatever they want. Like naturally, certain kids and certain genders do naturally gravitate towards certain toys. You can't, you can't change that. But t- turning around and saying they're not for girls or they're not for boys. But as you said there, you turn, when you flip it on the on its head and you suggest that as women and men we can't do certain things, you know, it kind of gets the old blood boiling. So mm. maybe that's what we need to be aware of, that we are put, we are kind of creating that mindset from a very young age if we're telling our kids, and you can't do that, that's just for girls or that's for boys. Like the ballet one, I, I didn't actually cover ballet in it, but I had a discussion with parents about ballet. And, and this parent couldn't see the irony in what, what they were doing. Her daughter play, um, played football and she did ballet. And her son played football. But she said, oh, God, no way would I allow him to do ballet. And she couldn't see the irony in, in what she was suggest- what, what she was saying. She couldn't even see the contradiction in what she was saying, that it was fine for her girl to do what was for boys, but it was not OK to do uh, for her son to do something that was, was associated with girls. And like, never mind that the strength that ballet, male ballet dancers need to have, well, all ballet, ballet dancers, but men were picking up women and dancing around. And, you know, there was just no, no kind of seeing that. It was just, no, that was for girls. And that was the way it was. Tunnel vision. Mad, Ted. Jen, thanks a lot for talking to me. <laughs> See you. Bye bye. That's uh, Jen Hogan. Uh, she's the blogger Mamatude, if you want to check her out. What's uh, the deal there if your son comes home and says, I want to do ballet, mom, or whatever it is, or if your daughter comes home and says, I wanted to go to boxing? Uh, What's your first instinct? Are you like, yeah, let's look it up and we'll see what we can send you? Or are you like, oh, I don't really want them to do that now. So I don't really like it. Be honest anonymously and tell me 0833333975. Uh, this texter says, you're too liberal on radio to care about Ireland and Irish, Irish issues. Mass immigration is a serious issue. This country can't afford to keep all these people. Clearly, we can't get our own kids into schools. We went to because the new Irish clog up the system. Healthcare in Waterford. Uh, gender stuff. You're a laugh with what's going on. Shame on you lot and the curse of the seven sins upon you. Daisha Today with Damien Tiernan on WLR. With thanks to Mulligans. Did you know you can collect your Blue Club points online? See mulliganspharmacy.com You are welcome back to the programme. Now Brexit is what we're going to be talking about next. Have a listen to this gentleman. At the moment it is absolutely true that our friends and partners are a bit negative. And you were getting, you know, I, I saw what uh, Donald Tusk had to say and, and it, you know, it wasn't redolent of, of, of you know, a sense of, uh, of optimism. But I, I think actually we'll get there. I think there is a real sense now that something needs to be done uh, with this backstop. We can't get it through Parliament as it is. One thing that slightly, I think, complicates the picture is that our EU friends still clearly think that there is a possibility that Parliament will block Brexit. And as long as they think there's a possibility that Parliament will block Brexit, they're unlikely to be minded to make the concessions that we need. So it's going to take a bit of patience. That is, of course, uh, the unmistakable sound of British Prime Minister uh, Boris Johnson. I have on the line Professor Patrick Holden, who's Associate Professor of International Relations at the University of Plymouth. And he's, of course, from Waterford. You're very welcome back to the programme, Professor Holden. Thanks, Maria. Morning. Morning. Um, we don't. This seems to be just trundling on again. I referred to it earlier on as a soap opera that keeps going on, and we have, you know, a slight change in personnel. Um, and you heard what Boris Johnson had to say there. It seems to me that there's still this stalemate, and who's going to blink first, and how can we move this forward? 
Yeah, and he doesn't seem entirely serious. If you, if you see him, even though from the tone of his voice, it's, it's, um, his position isn't realistic. He just wants to get rid of the entire backstop that's been, you know, agreed or negotiated for two years. And there's no way that the EU will, will agree to that. Uh, I still think a lot of it's for domestic consumption in, in the UK. I think what he wants or expects to happen is a parliament will block him because he actually doesn't have a majority or he's a very bare one. And at least 20, maybe as many 50 people in his own party have said, look, if you go for this no deal, we're, we're going to vote vote against you. And, uh, so I, I think he, he expects probably there to be an, an election and he wants to go into that election being able to say, look, I've done everything possible, Brexit, 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 but the Parliament have just stopped me. Or maybe even the courts might, might end up stopping him as well if he tries to do something radical. And th- that way he could he could win an election. What he do then, God knows, but that's uh, that's what I, I think the, the plan is. But it, it's hard to know at this stage. It's, <laughs> it's not realistic. Uh, he, he can't possibly believe that the EU are going to say after all this, Oh yeah, we'll just get rid of that because you don't like it. That that's just you know, that's that's a joke. Like so, he he can't believe that. Whatever else he believes. But if a no deal Brexit is going to be such a disaster and it's still so up in the air, should there not be a little bit of compromise on both sides? Is is, is the EU and, and Ireland right to like absolutely have the backstop categorically written in blood with no give on it at all, without giving him, you know, say, saying to him given him anything at all to come back with. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, well, that was always a question. There was always an issue for, for Ireland in that they wanted a backstop, but the backstop made a no deal riskier as well mm. because uh, it's hard for the Ukraine. However, it's hard to compromise now. It, it's really not clear what the Conservative Party would accept even. Uh, and I think if you even tried to give them a little, they just ask for more. And I, 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 I don't think it would work, actually. Some of them say even if the backstop was gotten rid of, uh, they wouldn't vote for this withdrawal agreement because they just have a complete completely different worldview about, uh, you know, basically Europe owes them effectively. And, you know, that's, uh, and that's completely incompatible with what the, the EU could agree with. So I don't think there is much room. Maybe, I suppose they could have considered a time limit for Theresa May, but I'm not sure that would have worked. And a time limit does kind of only kick the can down, down the road as well. But really, it's, it's tough for the Irish government. From the beginning, they'd only two choices. Either they join with, effectively become the UK's lobbyist in the EU to get the, the, the UK the best trade deal possible, or else they figured that that wasn't realistic. So they said, right, we've just got to align with the, with the EU approach and, and force the UK to sign a backstop, which I think probably will eventually work, but it might it could need, lead to a no-deal situation for a while, which would be very tough for, for everyone, obviously. And the sad thing about this is that while, you know, everybody is sticking to their guns and um, there's people who are trying to, plan for their lives and their businesses and it's all up in the air. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. We've done some like local research here with businesses in, in Plymouth and in, in Devon and they were saying that for the end of March they'd stockpiled a load of stuff and then it was, you know, it didn't happen obviously and it was even uh, useless but they've sorted that out and now they're expected to try and do it again for 31st of October just before Christmas. But but the worst thing is the issues like medicines and that and I think everyone should should cooperate on that and make sure that whatever needs to be done, uh, that, you know, there's medicines aren't caught up in some some mm. logistical mess that could happen but yeah it is a bit of um it's unfortunate but it is it it does lie with the, the UK's kind of had a hard line position to getting even harder and the position of Ireland in the EU was you essentially have to confront this rather than trying to compromise because it's hard particularly with the conservative party it's become very extreme and it's it's hard to try and uh, meet them halfway. And as you say, people who are so prepared to, to play to the home gallery, then you don't really want them in Europe anyway. <laughs> you just get yeah, gone yeah. and get well, lost. I'm, I'm convinced he's, he's doing this for mm. an election and it will be in, in early September there'll be a vote of no confidence that he'll probably lose. There was also the idea of even not an election, but just a replacement government, kind of government of national unity with Labour, Lib Dems, the SNP, the Greens and that, uh, and some Tories supporting it. But the, the thing is, 
Jeremy Corbyn obviously put himself forward as the Labour leader to do that, but that won't fly because even the Liberal kind of Tories hate Jeremy, Jeremy Corbyn yeah. and Lib Dem and something like him. So that, that's a possibility as well. But uh, it could end up, it could well end up in the, in the courts uh, in terms of, because the British Constitution, as you know, it's, it's not all written down. There's a lot of conventions and what you should do and so on. Uh, so we're, we're in kind of uh, uncharted territory. But I think it'll soon, in two or three weeks, we'll we'll see what's going to happen in British politics, either the government falls or uh, there's most likely a government falls. But if, if it doesn't, then we're, we're probably headed for no deal. But it's just hard. Most people in the UK don't support no deal, though. The, the businesses are against it, trade unions, Scottish government's totally against it, the Welsh government, then there's Northern Ireland. It, it's hard to see how they would really do it. But obviously, they're making their best efforts to, to bluff, which is quite, I think, in tune with the talents of Boris Johnson and mm. some of the people he has around them. I'm still not convinced that they're really going to do it because it doesn't really help them because they, they still have to negotiate the week after no deal. So, uh, But it's, it's high, um, it's a lot of pressure, obviously, on, uh, on, on Ireland and on ordinary people in the UK and Ireland in particular. OK, Patrick, thanks a million for talking to me. Thanks, See you. Bye bye. That's uh, bye. Professor Patrick Holden, there, Associate Professor of International Relations at the University of Plymouth. I say it all the time. Like you might think you're badly served with the politicians that we have, uh, and God knows, you know, could do better and all of that. But by God, <laughs> you'd have to feel sorry for the people of the UK with the representation they have across the board. Uh, nobody seems to have their best interests at heart, or even nominally, even pretending to. Uh, it all seems to be about party. Which party is going to win and shifting around? that and to hell with the people. 083 3333 for your uh, texts 0518461234 for your phone calls. Does anybody know if the toilets are still closed at Woodstown? If anyone answered that question yeah, somebody's wanted that information so we'll try and find that out for you. If any of you can answer you can let us know as well. And now let's see what Derma Power has. These are the days of our lives. The days of our lives on WLR. Brought to you by Home Instead Senior Care Waterford. When it comes to Waterford seniors, only the best home care will do. Homeinstead.ie My mother told me that she was only a young girl and was applying for a job in Denny's Cellar. Her requirement was to wear a shawl. Even though she would not wear one normally, as a shawl was a fashion that was rapidly disappearing in Ireland. The reason the young girls had to wear a shawl was to demonstrate that they were working class and needed a job. My mother told me that all the young girls rebelled against wearing the shawl and compulsory wearing of the shawl was abolished. My grandmother wore one daily except on Sundays when she would dress in her best clothes for mass or if we were going for a spin in the car out to Dunmoor or some other location. The shawl was used for carrying everything, especially children, and it kept them warm in winter. Women who wore shawls were often referred to as shawlies. Waterford country women up to the early part of the 20th century also wore cloaks. Now these were very elaborate, were an article of clothing that an adult would have for life. They were usually blue in colour and had a large elaborate hood. Women would wear a small raised piece of cloth on their heads which would be attached by a piece of ribbon under their chin to give the hood a raised appearance. These hoods were quite expensive and were made in leadly now shawls on the quay. They were also made in Herdens, which was alongside the present Granville Hotel. There are some great photos of Arundel Square and Ballybrick and Fair at the turn of the 20th century, which shows women wearing both shawls and the water of a cloak. Times not so long past that some of us can still remember. Talk to you soon. The Days of Our Lives on WLR. Brought to you by Home Instead Senior Care Waterford. Providing the most trusted local home care for your loved ones since 2009. Homeinstead.ie Data Today with Damien Tiernan on WLR. With thanks to Mulliganspharmacy.com. Life's a beach with Mulligan's Pharmacies. Open late on the Dunmore Road and in Tremor. You are welcome back to the programme. Just some breaking news for you and particularly good news if you're planning on flying with Ryanair. Uh, later this week, the High Court has granted uh, the airline an injunction preventing its Irish-based pilots from going on strike later this week. The orders remain in place pending the full hearing of the dispute. So uh, maybe a little bit of wait 
off people's minds if they're planning on uh, flying somewhere nice uh, with or even somewhere not nice that you have to go for business like you don't want to be disrupted by strikes uh, but there you go that's um, a little bit of a, a worry off your shoulders now I'm joined in studio by Mags Durand O'Connor who's organiser of the Donal O'Connor uh, Memorial Cycle you're very welcome back to the programme Mags thanks a million Maria um, the story of your your former husband Donald who died by suicide which is why you decided to bring this uh, memorial cycle into being and it should be in its eighth year it should be in its eighth year slight change of plan in the format this year yes slight change of plan we have had extraordinary difficulty getting insurance um, to run an event that we've run successfully without injury for the previous seven years. Um, we've been unsuccessful. It, we've spent most of the time when we would usually be organising our cycle, chasing insurers and trying to get sorted. So that was fun. But we eventually did get a quote, but it was so outrageously expensive. We couldn't do it because we would be asking people not to donate to Water for Marine Search and Rescue, but to give us money for insurance, which I'm not yeah. going to do. So we've had to have a rethink. And um, we're not going to let it go. We don't want the day. It's it's very important. It's World Suicide Prevention Day. We do the event for. It's Waterford's main event for World Suicide Prevention mm-hmm. Week. So for that reason, we really wanted to push forward. And of course, we raise money for a very important cause, the Lads of Waterford Marine Search and Rescue. So what are we doing? We're doing a spin-a-thon. Um, it's going to take place on Sunday, the 8th of September, um, down at the Waterford Marine Search and Rescue Base, which is down by the People's Park, past Domino's, down by the river. And what we're going to do is we're going to keep the wheels on the bike spinning for 400 minutes. That's a minute for every life lost to suicide in Ireland every year, um, which is still an absolutely shocking number. Mm-hmm. Um, it's more than one a day. It's, you know, there's a family devastation. More than the road traffic accidents, if yeah. I'm correct in saying. Um, but it's 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 a phenomenal figure and it's a shocking figure and it's a tragic figure because every one of those 400 is a family left behind, as you know. That's exactly it. There's a family devastated by every one of those. Um, the numbers have come down in Ireland, which is positive. Um, but it's still it's still not an acceptable number or anywhere near to be an acceptable number. So we try and get the message out that there is help, there is hope um, and to talk. And our event, we always encourage people to come, have... A, speak to each other, have a conversation, have fun um, and, you know, come together and realise nobody is alone. Um, There's somebody there for everyone. So that's what we try and get across with the event. So we're asking people, here's what we're at, we're asking people, not asking them to cycle for 400 minutes, you'll be pleased to hear. (laughs) (laughs) We're asking them to cycle for 15 minutes. We're asking, can you give 15 minutes for, for suicide prevention? If people want to get involved, they get in touch with us. They do that through our Facebook page, which is Doc Memorial Cycle. That's Doc Memorial Cycle. We're asking people to get in touch with us. We'll send you out a sponsorship card. We'll organise a time slot for you. Mm -hmm. You give us that 15 minutes. Thank you very much. And um, all proceeds raised will go to Water for Marine Search and Rescue, who do suicide patrols all the time and they keep people safe. And they've saved well over 150 la- lives to date. Fantastic you know, it, it's an amazing service they provide. They are, they're there 24-7. They're amazing people. And that's, that's uh, they're the beneficiary of the event, as well as everybody who attends. I imagine going home after a shift doing that and realising what you've done that somebody is going home because you were there. Now, in some instances, they're not going home because you were there as well. But that somebody somebody won't have to go through the trauma that, that your family went through, not once but twice, um, or won't have to deal with any of that aftermath of what if, why didn't I, and all the questions that, that, that come up about it. Um, it's a fantastic uh, service. It is, it is. It's an absolute gift. And what they do is quite remarkable. Um, it is quite remarkable. And it, it has saved... Mm. All those people having to go through that pain and even down to the misfortunate circumstance where somebody go, does end up entering the water and they're recovering that person. That still does give some peace to a family in that they're able to recover um, that person. So what they do is amazing. And the base that they've built down there, which um, the Don't Look on Memorial Cycle has contributed to building that base. But there's a family room down there. There's lots of facilities and we'll be giving tours on the day. What we'll also be doing on the day is we're going to have a family fun day. So not everybody in the family might want to cycle, but people might want to come down. We, we're going to have a barbecue. We're going to have Bouncy Castle and an inflatable, dar- uh, an inflatable bullseye where you'll have an opportunity to play games, kicking and football and try and get the <laughs> highest score. Um, and that's been very kindly donated by Bouncy Castle King, which is Shane Hearn. So thank you to him. We are are going to have face painting on the day. We're going to have barbecue. We're going to have lots of other games. So it's it's 
If you don't want to cycle, you're still welcome to come down, we're yeah. saying to people. But we would love to hear from people who would like to cycle. So just tell them how they get in touch with you again. So they get in touch with us through Facebook on our Facebook page, which is Doc Memorial Cycle. That's D-O-C Memorial Cycle. And we'll sort everything from there. Do you ever wonder what your life would be if it hadn't happened to Don- Donal and your, your brother? I, I do. I, I would imagine it would be very different. Um, I suppose, look, getting involved in mental health um, promotion and positive um, suicide prevention promotion has really, it's changed my life, but it's, it's, it's added a depth to it. But it has also, it's pulled me out of my grief. There's no way, I, I actually only said to a friend of mine um, when we were in the throes of trying to get the insurance and I thought the event might be cancelled and I just said, look, if I don't have this, I don't know. I don't know what I find myself in the end of a battle or something because mm. this helps me to get through the year that I'm doing something positive and trying to help somebody else from going through, try to stop somebody else from going through it. I have yeah, to go through. You, so. must, you must feel the same, I suppose, as the people in Waterford Marine Search and Rescue who go home and went, I, I did something good today. I saved somebody. And you must feel that same sort of thing that you're contributing to somebody not having to go through the pain well, that you it. went through. That's exactly it. That's yeah. exactly why I started doing it is if I could help even one person not to have to go through that, mm. that, that, you know, that in itself is a huge reward. Um, I, and I can't imagine my life having not even met the lads you know they're amazing people and now I would class them as friends um, you know and it, it's it's fantastic to have done that and it's opened up just a whole new world so, so September, every, September 8th the big day yes Sunday September 8th from what time uh, from 9.30 in the morning until 4 so there are lots of time slots there you know if it's a busy day it's the Harvest Festival that weekend as well which it always is when we run yeah. the cycle um, so you know if people want to go to the Harvest we're not stopping you just give us 15 minutes before <laughs> or after and, uh, 15 minutes not I could even manage 15 minutes I'd say oh is that a maybe not. Maria? <laughs> <laughs> maybe not maybe not when we don't have 24-7 we better not you never know uh, but um, the best of luck with it I'm sure you'll do excellently uh, and the amount of years, like eighth, eighth year, just call it the eighth year. It doesn't matter that they're not going on a particular cycle. It's still the same thing for still the, the great cause. And thanks very much for coming in and the best of luck. That's September Thank the you, 8th. Don't forget, Mags Durand O'Connor there, organiser of the Donal O'Connor Memorial Cycle. Station recycle this year, but still doing the same thing. Um, and that is it for today. You have been listening to Data Today, brought to you in association with Mulligan's Pharmacy. The programme is produced by Jennifer Long, with the assistance of Ashling Boland. Jeff standing by to take over in the lunchbox. Thanks for all your texts and comments, even the one wishing the seven, seven sins on us. Very Christian attitude there. Thanks very much. And I'll talk to you again in the morning. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. Bye bye.